Uh, welcome. Happy New Year. I'd like to call the Monday, January 10th, 2022 Beacon City School District School Board meeting to order. Let's begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. Um, please also stand for a moment of silence to recognize Shirley Hernandez, a retired bus driver for the Beacon City School District. Thank you. Kelly roll call. Delayed. Excuse. Galloway. Here. Ms. Johnson. Delayed. Ms. Rain. Here. Chris White. Here. Delayed. Sadler. Here. Here. Thank you. Matt, will you review the fire exits? Uh, exits are in the. <coughs> exits are in the back of the LGI. Thank you. We're going to begin with open to the public. Um, I don't see anyone in the audience here. Is there anyone on Zoom that would like to make a public comment? Seeing none, we can move on to our workshops. We have uh, three workshops tonight. We're going to start with one from our high school, um, Vanessa Defonce. Good evening. Um, first, I just want to thank you for the opportunity to share some things that have been going on at the high school. Um, I'm, I'm really excited to share some of the things that we've been doing to help support students this year. So first, I just kind of wanted to lay out for you some of the courses that we're offering students and some differences between last year and this year, just some data and information. Um, our AP courses, this year we were able to add an AP course. As you can see, we went from five offerings in 2020-2021 to six this school year. We added uh, AP drawing this year. Um, we have a lot of students who, who take advantage of these courses. Uh, we also have several DCC courses. So basically we have staff in the building who are certified to teach these college level courses. And it's really nice that we can offer that here for our students. Those, those are some examples of the courses that we offer here. And then I just put a little stat at the bottom there for you. We have 857 students enrolled at Beacon High School. And our daily attendance average is about 89%. Um, past couple of weeks has been a lot lower than that uh, because of everything that's going on. But typically, you know, we have a nice number of students in the building every day. Sorry, I had a question. So 89%, um, is that because uh, some people are still remote or? Oh, no. No, we don't offer a remote option. Okay. So That's like an average daily attendance. Students are out for different reasons. For different reasons? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because our graduation rate is above that. Oh, yeah. That has nothing to do with our graduation rate. It's just the number of students that we have in the building on a daily basis. Okay. Okay. So this, you know, uh, um, Vanessa referenced it the last three to four weeks of school, we've seen a decrease in attendance across all six of our buildings, just with everything that's going been going on with COVID. Um, you know, our hope is in a, in a week or two, we're starting to see it creep up a little bit already, but uh, in a week or two that that gets back up to normal. So that's been impacting attendance this year a little bit too. Okay. Yeah. I mean, the reason why I'm asking is because, because attendance sometimes is related to graduation rates, right? So if, if a student doesn't go to school, they don't know the curriculum, they don't pass the courses. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I don't know how that relationship works out per se, but uh, I kind of was, was expecting a higher attendance rate. But 
Yeah. Well, you know, like I said, there's different. That's an average. So yeah. it's not like every day we only have 89% students okay. here. Um, right. So that changes. And there's different reasons. But we have, for students that are out for specific reasons, too, we have a lot of supports we put in place for them. Okay. You know, it depends on, on the reason that they're out. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Um, these are just some examples of colleges where our students have been accepted so far. We have a lot. My slide, I'm sorry, the slide is different that I had to, to share with you. There's actually a lot more than that by now that we've had um, accepted. Some examples, and I'll just read them out to you. Marist College, University of Buffalo, um, Flagler College, Penn State, Mount St. Mary, LaSalle University. So we've had a lot of students who've already been accepted into different programs um, in different colleges. So. OK. So I just want to talk a little bit about you know, how we've been supporting our students. You know, as you can imagine, uh, having them go through the past couple of years with the pandemic and all the different changes. We've seen students come back to school this year with very heightened emotional needs, uh, mental health concerns, and some learning gaps. Some learning gaps are specific to actual academic gaps. Um, a lot of them are more specific to kind of students having lost some of their stamina, um, almost like forgetting how to be a student, for lack of a better term. So. What we have, we've put a lot of different things in place. One of the things we did was we sent out a survey to our staff first to talk to them a little bit about, you know, what kinds of things they're seeing. What are they seeing in the classroom? What kind of support do they feel they need to help support our students? Um, I'm going to just back up for one minute. Talking about the academic gaps, uh, we're going to put, we're starting this like within the next couple of weeks, it's called RISE, so Remedial Instructional Support and Education. So basically what we're gonna do is we're gonna have uh, subject-specific certified teachers from our building are gonna offer support about an hour once a week to students, and we're gonna really try to target who those students are. So we're gonna assess their needs. Our plan at the high school, um, instead of just saying, hey, we're offering extra help this day, you know, we know how that works with the students who really need it. So our plan at the high school is to really narrow down who those students are, send communication to parents, personally invite those students, and then follow up. So we really want to get these students in and get the support they need to start closing those academic uh, gaps that, are occur that we're seeing that are occurring with some of our students. Is that, um, Vanessa, is that happening during the school day? It would be, af it would be after school. <clears throat> so it's about an hour after school, once a week per subject. Um, we finally got our our teachers committed per each, for each subject, so we're just going to go now through the process of actually teasing out who those students are and what their specific needs are, so we can really target that. How, how, how early does that start? Freshman year, sophomore year? We're going to be looking at kind of a blend, but we're going to focus a lot on our freshmen okay. um, and some of our sophomores, because that's where we're seeing a lot of the gaps right now. Yeah. You know, when you think about it, these kids haven't been in, like our, our ninth graders, we sometimes look at them a little bit like seventh graders right now. They haven't been in school full time since their seventh grade year. So, you know, we, we want to try to move them not just academically, but in other ways as well. Socially, you know, we need to work with them and with all that. And that kind of brings me to this slide. Mm -hmm. So our response to intervention program that we have. Typically what we do with this program is we, um, we meet once a month. No, more often than that, twice a month. And uh, teachers will have tried different interventions in their classroom with students. I'm talking about a typical year, like pre-COVID. They will have tried different interventions with students who they're seeing struggling academically. And when they're finding that things aren't working, they're, they're collecting data, they're getting information, they'll refer them to this response inter, um, intervention team. And we'll sit down and we'll meet and we'll discuss the students, look at the data, and then try to put in other supports. So we're offering teachers different suggestions that they can try right there within the classroom. The teachers go back and they, they, they try that. A lot of times it works and, and that's good and they continue to support the students for the rest of the year that way. Sometimes it doesn't and they return to the table, to the drawing board and we try different things. And sometimes eventually it does end up um, having to be a, a referral to special education. What we're trying to do, that's still happening, but what we're also trying to do with our RTI program this year is look at it more as almost like a building level RTI because we're seeing these students coming in with all these needs that are really reaching outside just academic gaps, right? So 
this is where we surveyed our staff to kind of get feedback from them about what are they seeing, what are the concerns, and how can we put some blanket things in support for all our students right now? Almost like a reset. Um, we're also gonna be meeting, we haven't gotten to do this yet, but we're gonna be meeting with groups of, small groups of students, kind of cross-section of students, to ask them the same question. You know, what is it that you need from us to help you be successful? What do you see is going on in the building? Uh, we really, we're gonna target again ninth and 10th graders to start. Our, our juniors and seniors are behaving like juniors and seniors, so we're really more concerned uh, with the lower classmen right now, but then we can expand to that as well if we need to. So, yes, go ahead. I'm sorry, That's so okay. the RTI program, um, th this is a, for academic intervention, right? It uh, is, it's, it's not just academic. Sometimes we look at student habits. Okay. Um, what does their stamina look like? Um, you know, how are they coming into a classroom? Are there other ways that we can support students? Okay. Sometimes it is just academic based, right? There's sometimes there are yeah. gaps. And so we take an approach a little bit differently with those students. Okay. Um, but again, we're putting other things outside of the classroom in place for those students, like with the RISE program. Yeah. You know, teachers already do offer help uh, office hours as well after school. But what we're trying to do here building wide is really look at those students that are coming in with these other needs right now and try to help support our teachers to support those students, to kind of bring them back, you know. That's Let's good. get our students back. <laughs> yeah. no, so that's, that's what we're trying to do with, with this, um, with our RTI right now. Kind of, you know, yep. two different lanes. That's okay? good. Do you, um, so basically, we want like a structured response for our teachers mm -hmm. and for them to be able to work with our students. I'll wait till the end. Um, you know, some to, of the just, to, yeah. just to jump in for a second, um, uh, one of the things we've been seeing, and I, my guess is this is probably across most districts, is the students that are struggling the most this year at any of our levels are kids who kind of had major transitions during the pandemic. So we're seeing uh you know we're seeing more need like kindergarten and first grade at the elementary level like sixth grade at the middle school ninth tenth at the high school it's like kids who made a big transition in their schooling during all of this are are struggling more for sure so it's it's going to be a pattern you're going to be seeing when you hear the principals talk over the next few weeks like it's just it's just kind of a across the district issue and, and kind of to piggyback on that, we have 10th graders who've never even been in the high school and like aside from this year. This is the first time they've stepped foot in the high school because they were for some, you know, they were remote last year maybe. Um, so this is their first time. And we're walking, they're walking in, and I feel like, and I'm guilty of it too. We all started this year with, yay, you know, we're back, we're full time, and didn't really consider that. And so we're trying to kind of, like I said, reset. To, to get our students where we need them to be so that we can continue to move forward. And so we're doing things kind of parallel to each other, right? Trying to grade up students back is still moving forward and offering the academic support that they need as well. So that's kind of, that's been our building focus for RTI. I'm very excited to start meeting with those small groups of students. Um, the APs are gonna start working to kind of pull that together. I wanna hear what they have to say. Uh, I know I have a 13-year-old, and I know she comes home and complains about things that their administration puts in place. And I'm like, well, what would you want? And then hit me. And I'm like, you know, we need to ask the students. What do they need? What are they seeing? Just because we're seeing, you know, they're getting tired too easily. They may not think that that's what it is. So I, we want to kind of tap into them as well and see what they're experiencing and what would work. I don't want to put something in place, and they're going to they're gonna say to me, that's not going to work, you know? Mm -hmm. So we have to kind of work all together as a team. Okay, so something else that we've, we're gonna be looking into is uh, potentially moving to a nine period day next year. Right now we have an eight period day. Um, and I just wanna talk a little bit about what, is, what it would look like and then what the reasons are for doing that. Uh, so right now, if we were to move to a nine period day, the school day would still run 7.30 to 2.10. So it wouldn't affect busing or the times the students are here or their after school activities. The periods would just move from 46 minutes to 40 minutes, and we would continue with the four minutes of passing time. I have to tell you, I, I feel like 46 minutes is a long time for a student to be sitting in the classroom and moving, and I've worked in another high school where 40 minutes is plenty of time to get through what you need to get through. There's a lot of downtime at the end of the periods 
when you're stretching it that extra time. I know it doesn't seem like a lot, but it, but it is. Um, and then we were talking about moving. Homeroom right now is at the end of our first period. We're going to move it to the beginning. And yes, we have important announcements. Yes, we do the pledge. But we see, we notice that within the first five minutes, when teachers have to get up and start teaching right away, we have students kind of straggling in. So this gives us a chance to make sure that our students are sitting in front of us before we get right into our curriculum. So it just makes more sense to move our homeroom to the, first, to the beginning of the period. So these are just some of the benefits to moving to a nine period day. Um, it opens up opportunities, opportunities for us to offer more electives. It, um, it also gives us a chance to offer an actual formalized academic intervention service program and have students not have to give up electives because now they have this extra period to work with. It's not going to, it wouldn't, you know, replace the electives. It also helps us with um, room availability and that kind of goes together with the science classes and lab and PE benefits. So what really is good for a science class with a lab is if you can attach those periods back to back. Because if you're, for example, doing a really long lab, then you can carry it over, right, right into the next period. Right now, we have a lot of classes where our lab is not necessarily backed up to their core class. And that causes some problems for teachers that want to do these longer labs to be able to continue doing the lab, you know, continuously. So it's, it, this is going to benefit the science classes specifically, as well as um, our room availability. We'll have more spaces to work with scheduling. OK? Um, it also creates a meeting period for staff. So that will give us a chance to get more work done with staff during the day. So it's, it's called a meeting period. So we are able to call meetings whenever we need to during one period of the day. And we're going to look at some of our teams, like our RTI team, like our PBIS team, have teachers commit to a team or a committee ahead of time and make sure we can schedule them during the same period. Um, and again, it has no effect on the day of the timing of the, of the school day or the transportation. Okay, so before I move on to some uh, fun stuff, do you have questions I wanted about to thank, mm -hmm. thank you for bringing this matter up sure. formally for, for us. Uh, I support that move for all the reasons you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Certainly the opportunity for electives hits new high school students as a great opportunity. Yeah. Uh, one of the consequences we've seen of that is that uh, they have to start making choices, which is a good thing. But sometimes the choices are pretty, pretty dear. You may have to give up one thing because you only have eight periods mm -hmm. and you have many required courses that you must take to, to graduate starting with the freshman year. And so uh, it can be quite a challenge for students to do this. I think we'll see some benefit, assuming we go forward with this, uh, in the school music program in particular, because I know from music teachers that there is a fair amount of drop-off. Students would like to stay in band, but they have to choose. Right. So this would create another opportunity to have more than one elective. And I think that's a, a very good thing. I also very much like the idea that you can do uh, AIS uh, more than we are. And especially given what you just said about the impact of recovering from COVID, we need it more than ever. And uh, there's some other items in there that I hadn't thought about before. I thank you for bringing them to our attention. Of course. And, and now that you mentioned that, if I can also add one more benefit, um, we do have a lot of students who are part of our CTI program where they get bussed over to BOCES to take um, courses over there. And right now, because of the distance, they are only able to take three classes at the high school. So they have to get their core requirements done um, and then really don't have as much space to take advantage of some of the other things that we offer. So this would also give them a fourth period, um, which I kind of just thought of that today. <laughs> today, But um, the CTI program is pretty popular, and we have a lot of students who participate in that. So this would also help you know, to benefit them as well. So I just wanted to mention that. Did you Yes, go ahead. I know Beacon used to be on a ninth period, and then they went to eight period, and now you're looking to go back to the ninth period. Mm -hmm. Tom, I don't know if you know the rationale as to. Yeah, it was 13 years. I've been here 13, and we were only in eight periods. So okay, so sure. it had to be before that. I'm probably going back to when I was in school. <laughs> 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 the memory gets laughs and stuff. Uh, <laughs> it seems closer than it was, you know. So, I mean, as Sam 
really speak to what happened before that, but I can tell you that scheduling is kind of a tricky thing. I've seen a lot of, I can only speak to this because I've been a scheduling consultant in various districts and it's tricky. So sometimes if you're like, you, in your head you're thinking, oh, eight periods, maybe less staff or you know, uh, eight period, I don't know what their reasoning could have been, but that could have been it. But I can tell you that that's not gonna affect this model. Yeah, I you know, think it was because they were looking to go to a block schedule or something, yeah, that's and so another, they wanted a yeah. longer time. I, if yeah. I, it's again, I thought it was sooner than thirteen <laughs> years ago. So, <laughs> but I don't know. I think that was that was rationale. I'm right. not opposed to it. I was just curious as to why, why? we switched to it. Yeah. Go ahead. Will the minimum graduation requirements change or stay the same? No, they they stay the same. Okay. Yep. So if students wish to take just the minimum electives, they'll have a lot of free classes then. They, they potentially, but I, I mean, I think the point here is also that we like would push gauging. them. Yep. Yeah, we would have a lot more interesting, maybe some more interesting things or things that they're interested in, mm -hmm. and then we would have space to put them in place for them. Okay. You know, we have had students come forward, not necessarily with classes, but with clubs and activities, but this is another, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. avenue for them as well. Cool. Thank you. Just to go over some highlights, um, I was supposed to present in December, so I'll add to it a little bit as I'm talking through. Um, but at that point, this is kind of where we were at. Um, our fall sports, I mean, I'm sure you know, but I'd like to highlight our boys soccer team. They made it to the uh, state quarterfinals, which was so exciting. Right now we're into our winter sports and we're, we're doing well. Our homecoming, we had a homecoming dance for the students um, outside and we had 400 students show up and it went really well. So I just wanted to highlight that as well. And our home, this was my first year experiencing homecoming here. It was, it was awesome, for lack of a better word. Uh, the enthusiasm, the motivation, the staff got so involved, the spirit that whole week, like 9, 10, 11, and 12. It was great. It was very exciting to see. Um, so I wanted to highlight that as well. Our Beacon players, they, um, they had the Holiday Inn was in the fall. Well, it was like in the winter. And it was, it was a great success. Right now they're working on tryouts or auditions for Into the Woods, so that'll be coming in the spring. And then Mikey Fallon, I don't know if any of your students came home and talked about him. Okay, So he presented to all of our students. He also presented actually to the middle school students. And then he was here one evening for a parent presentation. And he talks a lot about tolerance and acceptance and diversity. Um, and he kind of does it through little stories he, he goes into character and he pretends to be um, different students, a little student at one point, a college student, and kind of goes through their experience and then talks to the students about that. So that, that was pretty powerful. Um, and the other thing I wanted to highlight was our Project HOPE. Our National Honor Society, um, they team up with Alpha Kappa, Kappa Alpha. They've been doing this for 12 years. And basically what it stands for is helping other people excel they were able to service this year 13 area food pantries, which is pretty cool. The community room was full of donations. They did a competition among uh, the different classes. The juniors won, so they're gonna get an ice cream social. I told her we'll wait till the spring and we can do it outside and when it's nice and warm. Um, so that was pretty exciting and it was exciting to see how many students participated in all of that. So these are just some of the highlights and things that, you know, positive things that have been going on at the high school. And that, that's it. I, I just want to jump in and just take a second to update the board on a couple of staffing things that we're thinking about or, or working on. Uh, we have seen an increased need uh, for social emotional support, especially at the high school. Um, so we, they, we uh, directed the high school to post for an additional social worker. Uh, so they're in the process right now of looking at applications and interviewing candidates. Anne Marie and I developed a plan to pay for it out of the uh, Rescue Act funds for the for this year and next year, uh, and then to take over funding of it uh, through the regular school budget for after that, because our our assumption is that we're going to need to continue that. Um, our we have a strong uh, mental health team at the high school, a really strong mental health team, but we we think an additional person who might also work with middle school kids for a part of their day would really help. Uh, again, we're looking at uh, someone who possibly has experience with either uh, or both individual counseling, perhaps drug and alcohol counseling, you know, that kind of uh, support. Uh, another thing Vanessa has started talking to us or Vanessa and her team 
is that they'd like to, uh, a, a few years ago, we talked with you all about getting a business teacher and a business program going at the high school. Uh, so Vanessa is really interested with, with uh, Corey and Tom of bringing that back. So we want to, you know, you'll be hearing more about that as we get into the budget process. Um, but I think, you know, you're, you're seeing a need. It's a hard position to fill, but you're seeing a need for that. And then lastly, and I, I always am hesitant to talk about grants before they're submitted, <laughs> uh, but we are going to be working with uh, uh, Dutchess Community College uh, on an upward bound grant for Beacon High School. Um, the great thing about it, there's several great things about it. One is they're writing the grant, which is, you know, after doing the, the grant this fall, I'm happy to have someone else write it. And, uh, but it's a five-year grant. It would support 60 students a year uh, that are either uh, low-income or first-generation college students or both. And uh, it would provide them with tutoring, academic support, a college-like uh, experience every summer. Uh, and it would be five years, probably totaling about $1.2 million uh, over the course of the five years. Uh, it's a very, it is a competitive grant process, but uh, the high school folks have put together a team of people to work with DCC in, in getting that grant in, so we're really excited about that part, too. Um, there may, with the nine-period day, is there's a chance we might also need an additional English teacher. Yes. Is that part of the nine-period day part or just part of the what you're trying to offer? A combination, I guess, uh -huh. um, because if we, you know, AIS and ELA is super important. So right. if we're looking to do that and continue with electives, you know, there's only so much you can do with a certain number of staff. So whether or not we go to a nine period day, it's something right. that we may want to consider. Right. You know, and you don't want to pull from from you don't want to pull from pushing our students to give students support or vice versa. Right. So, yeah. And forgive me if you already mentioned this. It's sort of in line with what Craig and Anthony were saying. Um, sometimes people hear nine period day and they think right. they're they're. Kid, there's kids might be in more study halls or but that's not part of the high school's thinking about it. Not at that all. Right? <laughs> no. That's not that's not the purpose at all. In fact the less study halls we give, the better, in my opinion. Um, yeah. no, that's not it at all. We want to be able to offer more electives and really tap into more student interest okay. than we've been able to. And we have teachers that are very passionate and motivated to take students to that other level in their subject area. And there's just no space to do that because, because then you have to make a choice. You know, I need to take my core class so I can't take this elective. That's what we've been seeing happen. And that is what will ultimately sometimes bump them to have a hole in their schedule to be filled with a study hall. That's what we've been seeing. That's right. what happens. Yeah. One other point. Uh, you mentioned that sometimes there's slack time at the end of a class. It's been my observation that sometimes teachers are giving homework time at the end of class and it isn't really homework if you're doing it sitting there in the desk in the school. Homework is really home and it's beyond what goes here. I like to think that our teachers are being paid to teach for the whole session, can not I, can just I, part of it. I'll speak to that because I've observed a couple of classes where I've seen that happen and it's not about that they want to just stop teaching. I see that they take cues from their students. And so what I've noticed, I even see it. And, and sometimes when I'm doing a formal observation, I can see them keep pushing through. And it's just, there's no point anymore. They've, they're done. They're done. After 40, 42 minutes, students just need some time to kind of like pause for a minute. So a lot of teachers, what they'll do with that time at the end, offer obviously to answer questions, but also give students like an exit ticket or um, um, an individual activity that just kind of reviews what they went over. So it's not, you know, it's not, okay, we got five minutes, let's just stop now and, and get your homework done. That's not what I'm seeing, and I'm sure Corey and Tom would agree, that's not what I'm seeing. They take their cues from their students, they move along, they stop, they go back, they pause, they regroup. Um, but 46 minutes is a long, it is a long time. It's a very long time to go, go, go. Um, and I just, what I'm, what my point to that was that 40 minutes is sufficient, is more than sufficient to be able to deliver a curriculum appropriately. And I've, I've spoken to every coordinator in the building and they all agree. You know, they would be the first to say, no, no, I need my 46 minutes. They would. <laughs> I agree 40 minutes should be sufficient. Yeah. Um, just to clarify, I know that you showed us the slide with the, with the additional classes, but um, the, the 
classes that will be um, offered as a result of this, they're still in development, like the full roster? Yes. Okay. Yes. And we have, I have had, yes, I have had some teachers already start putting forward proposals um, for some electives that they would like to offer. In the music department specifically, there's been a few, English department. Um, but yes, we're working through all of that. And if we are able to find a business person, if we're able to do that, that certainly is going to give us a chance to offer a lot of really cool things for the students. Okay, great. Yeah. That's exciting. Yeah. Just despite some teachers really liking their 46 minutes, how do the teachers feel about the nine period day? Uh, there's one department, <laughs> because they, they require some setup time and breakdown time, huh. that's a little bit resistant. Every other department is 100% on board. I haven't heard it. one person, have you, I don't know if you've heard, one person the say. Utilization is going to be huge because the science department especially gets hit with the uh, way they have to carry their, their labs and things to different classes. So yeah. it's really going to be a benefit for them, more opportunities for kids to, to take the science, the science classes with the lab, in the lab, as opposed right. to going to a classroom. So right. uh, that'll help tremendously. Yeah. So a lot of positive feedback from the ninth period. Ninth period. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, are the other high schools in the area? Are they on eighth period or ninth period? I think it depends on where you look. I mean, the schools I've supported through scheduling, quite honestly, have been in Westchester, and we've always worked with a nine period day. Okay. Um, and again, and, and I, I go back to the, I know it benefits, it has a lot of benefits, but I always go back to the science because I'm a scheduler. Yep. And it just, it just makes more sense that you can dovetail those classes together, your core class with your lab class. It just yeah. makes sense. Um, but along with all the other benefits, so. And it gives you a lot more flexibility, you know? Uh, I'm, I'm glad to hear about the additional social worker, you know, um, you know, this, yeah. um, the, um, uh, the, the extra, and, and I'm glad that, that, you know, the study time is not going to be like used as a filler. I, you know, you're trying right. to engage the students to do more electives and stuff. Um, I, I also um, was interested to know whether, you know, perhaps maybe, um, you know, nine classes in a day, um, you know, that, that is a lot of work, but um, w instead of study periods, um, you know, medit meditation time, you know, could also help with mental health. Well, I mean, one of the things that we definitely are working towards as well is running, you know, some groups and circles with students. So that might be another opportunity, you know, in their day to, yeah. to schedule. You could just, there's so much you can do with it. There's so much you can play with. You know, it doesn't, ha and you can be very creative mm -hmm. when you're scheduling, when you have more periods to work with. Yep. Science projects, all that stuff. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot that you can, there's a lot you can do. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Thank you so much, Vanessa. Thank you. <clears throat> no, thank you. Next, we're going to hear from Daniel Glenn from South Avenue. Good evening. I'm happy to be here to speak to you on this, this chilly night. Um, before I start, um, um, I want to say that I'm so happy to be um, the new principal of South Avenue. It's been great. Even in the context of COVID, we've been able to rise to the challenge, our teachers, our students. So I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased to, to be a part of the, the Beacon community. And I, I've kind of made this slogan, where passion meets purpose. And um, the students, uh, it's my vision that they develop their passion here, that they find in their subjects where their passion is to meet their purpose in life and to figure out where they want in their career goals. Um, Meredith came up to me before the uh, meeting. I didn't know she was a photographer of this photo of former South Avenue um, students. Um, and to me, when I Google South Avenue, um, this is the first picture that came up um, for me. Um, and these are former students I met here 
and decided that they were going to get married in front of South Avenue. And I thought that sort of embodied what um, South Avenue is all about. It's about family. It's about community. And the area around South Avenue has changed. But the, the mission and, and, and what it accomplishes for kids is still the same. So I, I thought that was a beautiful picture, Meredith. You really captured that. Um, they have since relocated. Um, they are Their daughter actually did go to the school, um, but they've re relocated to North Carolina. So um, I thought that was a, a, a great um, photo up for South Avenue, building lasting relationships. Um, the first um, tenet that I would like to go over is excellence. Um, and in addition to our robust curriculum, we're extending learning opportunities beyond the classroom um, in informative trips and experiential activities that engage students' curiosity and affords them the opportunity to reflect on their own metacognition. And we have the land to learn. Um, even when I was a teacher, we didn't have a garden program, and the kids are actually planning things and learning and conversing with each other. Um, and, and the ladies facilitating it, and they're telling me about the program, how it developed. So it's 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 really um, instrumental at South Avenue. Um, we've um, reenacted the, the um, trips, Denning Point, um, Long Dark Park, where they learned about animal adaptations, and of course um, we have Mr. Burke here, who's a rock star here. Not only is he the science person, but he also facilitates the news programs that is student centered. The students run that, and we have teacher supports. Um, assessment, data meetings, observations, and classroom visits. Excellent, a supportive culture. Um, we have a school vision of high standards, and we want to ensure that all students are successful. Each student should be set up for a level of success. So the student platform is really the news. Um, since I was new, I wanted to, to, to sort of make my presence. So I use the announcements as a way to make my presence. Um, I set the framework for the day. Um, I um, share that, um, you know, every day I enumerate the school-wide rules, treat others fairly, always do your best work, solve problems with kind words and be a good listener, be responsible for your words and actions, be safe and respectful of your body and school property, keep our hands to ourselves at all times, and using our words when we express to people how we feel and knowing the right words to choose. And, um, you know, I do... Judge Judy is one of my favorites, and I, actually one of my friends gave me this win or lose by how you choose, and it has short little vignettes with choices, and we did that for, um, for three months, and the kids actually came up to me because I go into the cafeteria, and I greet each student at each grade level. I make sure that my schedule is blocked out, that I get an opportunity to walk around, talk to the students in a way that's different from in the classroom. Um, and they really like the um, win or lose, how you choose by Judge Judy, who I think is retiring this year. Um, also, um, I spent two months doing kindness um, because I think that's the framework of all behavior. Um, and, and since last year, we had a fractured year. Um, the kids have been at each other's throats. You would think that, you know, because they were so separated that, you know, they would be thriving to have. But um, they, they really... Um, embrace kindness, the, the, the kindness um, announcements that I made. I got a lot of drawings, classes gave me anchor charts. Um, and people said, Mr. Glenn, that's not kind. You know, they, they talk about that. So they really internalize that. Um, student of the month is something that I introduced um, this year. And you think it's a small little thing to recognize students. But it actually really ended up, the, the students are really excited to be announced and selected for students of the month. Um, so I think that's a positive um, thing to support culture. We have Athletes of the Month, which our gym teachers do. Um, restorative sessions um, with students if they commit an infraction. I try to be um, restorative rather than punitive. I do mediation sessions um, to help them uh, improve their learning and connect to their learning. Um, and I do birthday announcements um, to students and staff. And it's a way to support culture, and, and, and the kids really like it. Yes. Can you describe the picture in the middle? So the picture in the middle is our students of the month. Um, I don't have the students of the month for January, but I do have them for December. Um, they are awarded um, our certificate. Um, I don't do anything because we really don't want to. I want to abstain from social distancing, but um, I announce their names on the um, announcements. The teacher celebrates them in class, and then they take a picture, and I put it in my newsletter. So it's like one from each class. It's one from each okay. class per month. Um, so, uh, we have equity. We're, we're always sharpening our equity lens by supporting students of different backgrounds. 
We value the contributions of people across the diaspora in academic discourse. And um, here are some of the things that I'm doing that I'm excited about. Um, we have our Martin Luther King celebration. I think it's the first one um, where we showcase student talent in an assembly-based program where they um, recognize uh, Martin Luther King through a song or dance or a poetry. And the teachers are excited. They have a lot of teachers that um, have signed up for it. I, w I wanted it to be where parents came and um, the school can gather together. But since, since COVID, we're going to tape them and play it on the school news. But I'm really excited about that, and the, and the teachers are really excited about that. Um, September, October, um, I recognize um, prominent Hispanic Americans for Hispanic Heritage Month. Um, I played music. Gloria Stefan was one of my favorites, as the people already knew. Um, <laughs> we, we, we talk about Schomburg, the Schomburg Museum. We, we really recognize, and there was displays in the, in, in the hallway that recognized Hispanic Heritage Month. Um, last year, um, for classroom read-alouds, the equity team came up with, um, uh, they had each teacher read a book that reflected um, diverse cultures, <laughs> and the teacher um, selected a book appropriate for their age level and read it to the class. From, for Black History Month, um, the culture um, committee decided that they were going to do posters. Um, each class is going to focus on um, a prominent um, African-American figure. And then we're going to do a gallery walk um, of all of the work that the, the classes have done. Um, school news is something that we, we talk about equity. Um, in October, um, we had a music assembly that showed um, music across cultures. Um, it was another way to do social emotional. Every month, I'm trying to do a school-wide thing. So it's effortless. We're coming together as a, as a community. And the music assembly was um, one of the things. Um, the sock drive. Um, our student council members came up with a sock drive for the battered women's shelter, and we have World Language Month. And you know, cultural equity to me is, is very important. Um, we have the theoretical framework, but the hard work is the hard work, and, and changing someone's heart, and we, and we try to do that every day. <coughs> um, we, I try to create a, a culture of care, safe and supportive emotional environment, social skills training. Um, a social worker and um, I saw a psychologist went into different classrooms um, based on the need of the teacher, and they did social skills training. I do conflict mediation with kids if they have a conflict. Um, the zones of regulations are three different colors to, to regulate and, and to see where you are emotionally. We've used that, and the teachers are using that. Um, we have an ice cream social. I know you mentioned you're doing an ice cream social at the end of the year. We did, I decided to do it at the beginning of the year. I thought it was a great surprise for them. It was another school-wide um, event, um, and it was a way to address uh, the social emotional. The kids were saying, oh my god, Mr. Glenn, this is fun. The teachers got involved, so I, I thought it was a great thing. Um, teaching tolerance in the classroom presentations, our social worker um, and psychologist um, facilitated those. Spirit Week was great. It, it demonstrated school pride. Um, I forgot what it was. Pajama day, bring in your teddy bear. Um, where are your favorite colors? It, it, it was great. Um, and of course, then I promote uh, the environment of kindness. Um, it, uh, our communication with stakeholders was paramount. Um, some of the things that I use to engage our stakeholders in our school community events is the Blackboard system, my monthly newsletters, um, close collaboration with a PTO, community coat drive. Um, we had a fire prevention day, trunk retreat. I, I will admit that I, it was on a Friday, and I was dragging my feet. It was such a long day and that I had to return to school. But let me tell you, the attendance for that event, it was my first trunk retreat. That, I, I mean, it was so well attended. It was a nice night. Um, there was no conflict. Um, I, I think 98% of the school <laughs> went to this trunk retreat. It was such a great event, I was, and it was my first time ever. Never had a trunk, been to a trunk or treat. It was, it was very, very nice. Um, a parent, um, she is planning to do a mural. Um, I guess we're getting this amusement style playground in the back of our school. Um, so she was going to do uh, a mural in the back, and I told her to hold off because I didn't know what the construction was, was what, what it was going to be like. But she is doing a, a, a mural 
and the front of our building is going to reflect our diversity. Because when you do an equity walk, not only should we reflect equity in, in what we teach, but it also should be reflected in the physical building. And so um, she's going to give the kids templates, and um, they're going to design it, and then I guess she's going to put it all together, and we'll have a mural outside. And I guess we'll use the same procedure for when we have our playground mural outside. Um, oh, I forgot to mention, um, South Avenue it turned 94 this year. Um, so um, for our 100th anniversary, and I was planning to have this big barbecue for alumni and current students, we're going to do a time capsule this year, um, collect artifacts of this time period and, and this, this unprecedented times. Hopefully we won't be in per perpetuity with these masks in six years. But um, I was planning to collect um, a lot of artifacts and, and material that um, from parents, not parents, from teachers and students, and we'll seal it and we'll open it up our 100th anniversary. So um, that um, this is just my newsletter. This is the staff newsletter that I send out weekly. Um, I try to do social emotional in the staff newsletter, try to have positive comments in the staff newsletter, um, pictures. Because I give my statement, I wish I would smile. I think the next one I will. Um, I highlight um, teachers, because sometimes teachers are not recognized or forgotten, and to highlight their special events in this particular um, newsletter, uh, we have Nadia, who came from JF, and she's not going back. <laughs> we, like, we love her here. Um, and um, I try to do positive comments. Of course, we have, uh, you know, notes. Um, here's a family newsletter. Um, this is the student of the week photo that you saw earlier. This is for Thanksgiving. Um, I talk about some highlights. Um, in this particular newsletter, I talk about um, the parent-teacher conferences. Um, actually, this was the um, music assembly that we did um, for students. Um, try to have quotes and, and positive things. Introduce new staff members. Sustainability, a healthy school climate, improving educational programs, um, our outdoor classrooms, our garden club. We just bought a weather station. Um, our student council does a lot of things with the, with the community. And Mr. Burke, our rock star, um, he participated in something where he won, we won a 3D printer and coding robots for the school to enhance our educational programs. Um, uh, what I failed to realize, and um, we also have RTI. Um, it's a problem solving um, team where kids who, who have deficits, we try to increase their proficiency using um, a database um, um, system and, and research based um, to help improve our students' um, aptitude. And I also um, forgot to mention that I started PLC groups with this, the teachers this year, which is also a problem solving um, team where they analyze student data and analyze student work um, to help support teachers. What does PLC classroom. stand for? Professional Learning Communities. Back. Yes. And finally, oh, yes. I like the STEM uh, materials you've gotten. That's pretty oh, Right. Cool. It's enhancing, you know, our educational program. Yep. And finally, uh, my dream is to um, get Ruby Bridges to speak at our school. Um, um, she's an American civil rights activist. She was the first African-American child to desegregate the all-white William Franz Elementary School, which was damaged in Hurricane Katrina. Um, but she's still here. <laughs> During the New Orleans school desegregation crisis of November 14, 1960, she is the subject of a 1960 painting, The Problem That We All Live, by Norman Rockwell. Um, she's still living, um, and she's $33,000. I already spoke to Anne Marie about it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure if we can get her, but maybe it's something that we can do on a district level. I think that. I'll make a motion. That, uh... Yeah, that we can, we can get her. And that's it for South <laughs> Avenue. Are there any questions for Daniel? I, I just wanted to say as a South Avenue parent that um, I really appreciate the newsletter. Oh, and it's you. very anchoring to get that regular source of news. So I, I appreciate that. And um, major kudos for the classroom read alouds. Mm -hmm. That did change the way the kinds of conversations that my kids were having and the kinds of things that they were understanding about the immigrant experience and, and that was, it was pretty mind blowing, like how, how much that impacted their, their thinking. So I really yeah, appreciate that. Yeah, I forgot that. to mention, did they like, did your student like the school-wide dance-a-thon? 
Um. You know what? He <laughs> didn't. They, neither one of them mentioned it. Okay. Yeah, we had a school-wide dance-a-thon at the end of the year, which is, I mean, in December, which culminated all of the dances that they learned in gym. Um, and we were outside in the back, and it was another school-wide thing, social-emotional, and they really had a great time. And the final part of it was then they did their own freestyle, which <laughs> liked. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, my sons aren't big dancers. Right. They might have something to do with them. <laughs> <laughs> Any other? Anthony? Yeah, I mean, I made the comment about the STEM. I mean, again, like, thank you very much. It seems like uh, you're investing a lot in not just the emotional intelligence, but also to expand the curriculum. Um, and uh, I didn't peg you as a Gloria Stefan fan. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, yeah. I, I actually prefer Celia Cruz. But, okay. Um, but no, that's, uh, that's awesome. Thank you very much. Yeah. I just want to say, uh, you know, it's been really nice. Uh, to have uh, the additions of some new folks this year and both Vanessa and Daniel have done an outstanding job walking into their schools and in a challenging year and uh, <clears throat> I, I shouldn't give away one of my little data points but I'm going to give it away tonight and it doesn't mean you can never be in your office but you know I, I come into the schools a lot and both Daniel and Vanessa are out in their buildings all the time at the cafeteria you know in classrooms and that's always a great sign and I also just wanted to point out uh, Corey Dwyer our new assistant principal for the high school is here sitting next to Tom who's been here 13 years I didn't <laughs> uh, but anyway Corey's been a great addition to the high school as well so it's it's uh it's been great um you know, that you all kicked it off tonight. Kind of not the way we planned it, but uh, but thank you for two great presentations. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. I, I really feel um, I'm hearing a lot of warmth and care about the students who need it so much right now. And mm -hmm. uh, it's, you know, it, of course, there are a lot of concerns uh, about what's going on, but it sounds like you're aware of them and you're actively trying to make the students feel comfortable and at home in, their, in the schools. And I, um, Daniel, I just want to say that I love hearing all the school-wide stuff because I think it is really important for these tiny kids to see the fifth graders do stuff and for them to feel that they all belong together. Um, and also just in your family newsletter, I thought it was really great that you um, were giving instructions about the parent-teacher conferences because I think we have to remember that that can be a really nerve-wracking experience for parents who haven't done it before and they don't know what they're um, what their rights are, what they can ask, and you know what they should be trying to get out of it. So I thought that was a really great thing that we can forget about, but um, important to remind parents. So thank you very much. Um, so m we have one more um, short workshop that is uh, Q and A about uh, public and non-public schools and what our relationships as a public um, district are to the non-public schools in our area. Um, we, Matt, do you want to just start? Yeah, just yeah. Um, so the, it's, it's kind of an informal, if Anne-Marie and Saga could get near a microphone. <laughs> 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 There's two. I don't know if you want to split or whatever, because you'll probably have more to say okay, than me. Uh -huh. And I also, I want to say the, all the nice things I said about our administrators, that was also my cue that you all can go, because you're up very early in the morning, and, uh, Figuring out how to get through another day of challenges. Thank you. So uh, I apologize about the informal nature of this. What I was going to do is just sort of verbally go through uh, what we do and what any uh, district in New York does uh, with non-public schools that are within their district. And then uh, just open it up for questions. Um, and probably Anne-Marie and Saggy will be the ones answering more than me. Uh, but just the overview uh, of, the, of the relationship is uh, one of the parts of it is busing. Uh, so we provide transportation um, to <coughs> students within the district who go to a non-public school um, as long as it's within. Um, it's within 35 miles between uh, to add a district so that would include all the district you know all the schools that are in district and then out, outside of here right okay the other thing we do is uh, or another thing we do is we purchase textbooks uh, for non-public schools that are within Beacon City School District and that's a combination of state and local funds 
that covers that? Yeah, so each private parochial student, uh, wherever they go to school, would, would get a, um, a textbook. It's a loan um, allotment. Um, but we don't really um, have a limit about what they get, you know, within, if it's allowable under here, we, we actually order it and have the book sent to their private parochial school. So just with that, Emory, do they submit what textbooks they need or do they get the textbooks that we use as a district? They get what they need, they ask. Um, and, I, and obviously, you know, within limitations of what we're allowed to buy from the school district, but they do get what they need. The only thing that we require them to do for both transportation and textbooks is to um, register with the district, meaning that we check, you know, their, um, that they live here, that they're residents, and so then they could get both of those things. So the kids that come to a, a private school in Beacon that are not from Beacon, we don't purchase textbooks for them, their home Their school home does? district provides the, the textbooks for It's them. only for Beacon students that correct. attend the private school. Yes, correct. So if we have a kid going out to a private school outside of Beacon, we would have to pay for the textbooks for that student. Yes, and the schools directly, you know, um, contact us yep. with the with the books, and then we order them and have them sent. Sa out. Same same concept with the busing. If a student from Newburgh is coming to one of our one of the non-public schools, Newburgh is busing them here. Correct. Or I'm just using that yes. as an example. Mm -hmm. The district, their district of residence. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to look at Saggy. The, another way we uh, interact with non-public schools is through Title I and Title II, or I'll look to both of you. How does that work? Well, one of the things, well, coming into it, uh, we, do some, we, do, we do meet and consult with them um, under Title I. They're entitled to certain monies, whether to uh, provide intervention for their students or s support. Right now, um, one, of the, one of the schools is actually choosing to provide an after-school program with their allotment. So that's what the entirety of the money is being used for. And then Title II is actually professional development. So there is some money that if they want to do any kind of professional learning, that they're able to do that as well. And does the state allocate a certain amount of funds per student that is placed at the school? Yes. So there's a formula um, in terms of the monies. And Marie knows more about the formula, but mm -hmm. they are this specific formula. And again, it's based on free and reduced lunch. That's how you qualify for it. Right. So if Beacon stuff. had five kids going to the private school, and let's say the allotment was $1,000 per kid, that school would get $5,000 from the Beacon City yes. School District. Yep. And we had a, you know, the transition this past summer uh, was, was tricky because we had the two people uh, in the district who did this, Eric Wright and Samuel Sims, both left the summer and kind of left a little bit of a gap before replacing them. Um, so some of the work that would typically happen in the summer got going late summer and into the fall. Um, but that will be addressed. Um, you know, the next go around, or already is being addressed now. Um, another way, this is new, uh, but another way is uh, a, another interaction is through the CARES money. And Anne Marie, maybe you could speak to that. So it was the a first bit. round of CARES money that we received um, in, last year. So the, uh, the, the first CARES Act did have a portion that needed to be allocated to private parochial um, schools in your district. Um, so that was the, they changed the formula for the second CARES Act and now for the American Rescue Plan where there is federal money available for private parochial schools directly, that they applied directly. But the first go around there was a portion, it was done similar to the title grant on the calculation of how much had to go. Um, and then we, we notified the private parochial school and they, um, the one that happens to be in our district happened to use, um, they bought Chromebooks and um, and I can't, thank you. I, I blanked on that. Yes, smart boards. Smart boards. Smart boards. Mm -hmm. um, and and this, is, this is a lesser example, but uh, just even the uh, rapid test allocation that came to school districts uh, on, when was that? January 2nd? Mm -hmm. um, or anyway, somewhere around there, right? Yeah. Second. Uh, the, 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 the governor, the governor's office, uh, whoever is responsible for it, put out a thing saying we're also providing a separate allocation to all non-public non schools. Um, and in fact, I saw someone from one of the non-publics at the vaccine clinic tonight 
and asked them if they've gotten the tests, and they said they had gotten the home test kits. So one of the things, like, at, I don't know, I, this is just kind of a funny example. When we were passing out the tests, mm -hmm. it was just a week ago. Yes. <laughs> Seems like longer. <laughs> uh, when we were passing out the tests, like a number of, uh, not a huge number, but a number of parents of private schoolers came through wanting, and we kind of tried to work that out with them. Uh, but now it's been confirmed, you know, it's like, it's not always perfect the way that works from the state level, but I, it seems like they're really trying to allocate all these things mm -hmm. that are COVID related to make sure everybody gets it. Right. Sometimes we're involved and sometimes we're not, right? Mm -hmm. So CARES money we were, or the at, CARES. At the very first part of CARES, right. right. As, as the CARES went out to the second allotment, we were taking out of the loop and then they were directly getting right. resources from right. the feds. Right, and so I'm just using the test kits as sort of like an example. Like we weren't, I wasn't given 500 test kits to get out to all the non-publics as well. Um, and then, and then lastly, last year uh, we had a lot of flexibility with the uh, with the meals program, and we did uh, provide meals for. Was it the whole year, or it began after? The, we started a little bit after the year began, right? Yes, well, we started very pretty pretty early on in that aspect, but we were able to feed um, anyone that that it was you know a, an open site. It was considered an open site, so we could feed anyone of the children in our area. Okay. Um, and so we did that with one of our non-publics last year. We did, yes. And then another example uh, of something that's um, was a change for us. This one I just thought of uh, smart bond money. So smart bond is an interesting one because if you did computers through smart bond, you actually a district if you if you did a, a laptop purchasing, um, you you needed to allocate some to non-publics. That was our original plan years ago, mm -hmm. but as you remember, we ended up doing that through the school budget, and so we switched it over to security, mm -hmm. uh, like cameras and you know the alarm system and the notification system and all those things. If you do security through smart bond, that is district specific. It doesn't go, that allocation doesn't go to non-public schools in your district. I guess that makes sense because providing security things for other buildings wouldn't, wouldn't right. really make sense. Um, but that's something that I learned about probably last year, I think, just with that change. But it was um, nice having the CARES allocation because then, you know, if, if uh, private, um, private parochial school wanted to take part in the smart bond and we had changed it to security, there was that availability to get Chromebooks and smart boards um, that they had need, they had wanted to get. So it had actually worked out. So yeah. two of our main point people are Saggy and Dawn Candelo this year is our Title I coordinator. She receives the stipend to be the Title I coordinator, right? So you two uh, work with non-public schools for like the title allocations? So we have a meeting this month, and yep, we kind of went over everything. We made sure that they had copies of everything that was purchased, purchase orders, so it was full transparency so they can see exactly how we're spending the money. And then again, um, making when we went over kind of Title I and how they're spending the money. So again, and that can change. They don't have to spend it that way. So next year, if they want to do something different, they know how much they have, so they can spend it any way they want, but it has to be within the guidelines of the title, so the title is very specific of what you can use the money on. So, so again, I know it's informal. Uh, you know, we, we met with, uh, for agenda setting, we met with Meredith and Flora um, on Friday. And um, so we just put, we want to put just an informal list of the ways we do interact, because Anthony, you asked about it several meetings ago. And for questions you have tonight or in the future, like, you know, it, it doesn't have to be the only time we talk about this, but we want to just put the list together. So one of the things we had uh, community members from a private school come up and ask us about lunches and that the, that the district stopped providing lunches. So I didn't hear that as part of the responsibility that the district has to the private school. It, it's it's not. Um, it is something that is to doing it is a possibility. Um, it's a possibility through 
what what's the process? The the they become a a formal site, a meal site. A meal site. What exactly. is it called? What's the process called? I forgot the application process. But okay. I have to. And so so we started going through that. We met with state officials. We met with the uh, uh, folks at the school. Mm -hmm. um, they've completed their part of the application or the information requested by the state. Right. Um, we did a we did one day as a, like a test run just to see because so last year the federal government basically waived a lot of the rules that govern food and all those rules are back. And so Karen wanted to do a test run mm -hmm. to see if we could deliver hot food because it has to be a certain temperature here. It has to be a certain temperature there. And, you know, that's why Karen's good is she makes sure all that stuff is followed. Um, so, so that's like the first part of it. The second part of it is finding out if we were able to do it, um, what, you know, the, the money we would be getting back from the federal government is meal reimbursement, correct? Correct. And then taking that money and finding out what's affordable for us to do as a district. And that's part of what we're working through now um, because we're, we're not certain. Uh, the, it would cover some of what we do, but not all. The meal reimbursement from the federal government would cover some of what we do, but not all. All, right. And that's... That's the part that we're still kind of working through. One of the things that's held us back a little bit from working through it further is, and I'm not meaning at all to sound dramatic, but we've been through a rather massive staffing crunch uh, in all departments the last month. Uh, Karen is essentially uh, managing meals at one of the schools. You know, she's our director, but she's doing the equivalent of uh, the principal teaching a class or the... <laughs> or whatever, like she's taken over the meals program for one of our elementary schools, right? Yeah. And we also just, like all districts around, have had a number of people out and in over the last three or four weeks, so we haven't been able to do that part. We are, I think, estimating, though, just a rough estimate that we probably would need to pay a little bit beyond what the federal meal reimbursement would be, mm -hmm. and that would probably be towards administrative costs. Yes. And would that come from the general fund, or how does that... How would that work? Um, I, I spoke uh, a while back. I spoke with our attorneys. Um, that would be something that I could not just do alone. That would require uh, authority from the board. Mm -hmm. um, anything that we spend that's kind of outside our purview, so to speak. Like um, um, last year, just to compare to last year, last year the meals program was much simpler. Yes. <laughs> it was... I mean, I think we all kind of saw the meals program at some level working. It was just kind of putting meals in boxes and, and milk crates and sending them off. This is a much more involved process that would require a bit more administration, so the costs are different. Um, that would require authority from the board in a formal way. It would require a board vote. So what we'd have to do is we'd have to put together exactly what would be needed to do it and put it in front of you if that's what you'd want to see, you know, to then discuss mm -hmm. as pre, a board. Pre-COVID, did Beacon supply meals for private schools? No. no. Districts? No. So the, the, smart, the smart thing with the bond is what the question I was going to ask. So yeah. um, before the smart bond, we didn't provide tech to private schools either, right? We didn't provide provide technology to private schools either. We could loan them technology um, in a different way through the general fund, but no, we did not purchase um, technology for them. We had no but, avenue to do But that. some of our non-publics have been purchasing technology through, like you said, was it CARES or CARE, Title? Yes. So CARES yeah. was the first round of CARES was very beneficial um, because their allotment allowed them to actually purchase the technology, probably more technology than they would have gotten through the smart bond, because the smart bond really didn't allocate that much to private parochial. Mm -hmm. But before that, there was no way to... There, to okay. No. Okay. No. And um, uh, the, the, the venues that we're using now to provide them with um, resources... Um, they're not permanent, right? They're just based on certain allotments that for that time. It's not like the the, the textbook, right? The, the textbook, textbook purchasing. I, I hate to say permanent, but that's been an established part of schools yes. in New York for decades, probably, right? Yes. As along with busing. Yes. Um, so 
those are probably as close to permanent <laughs> okay. as you could be. Yeah. Title being a federally funded is pretty close to permanent. I mean, title changes their rules sometimes or their... I think the allotment will change year to year. Right. Uh, we're pretty much Title One, Title Two. That those are pretty pretty set. The, it's just the, the amount's always different every year because it depends on how many right. kids qualify. The things that are not permanent here are CARES. Yeah. In fact, that's very temporary. Mm -hmm. And um, and the 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 food flexibility we have that was definitely temporary. Um, and then change. now I think. Anyway, I was just thinking of like COVID stuff. I think because we, the the board has asked for all the, you know, whenever I'm talking about things we're doing with COVID, like test to stay or all those things, you all have asked a question, who's paying for that? And currently that's the county paying. The county has a federal grant, yes. essentially, mm -hmm. to pay for that. Um, I don't know how, I know the county's working with, if that's all through the county, they're working with non-publics in some way about that, I'm sure. It's, we're just not a part of that we're at all. We're not part of that. So, I, you know, there's been some very temporary things that have come up, obviously, because of the pandemic and all the aid that came out with the pandemic. But the busing textbook and Title I and Title II are probably, well, you could say, pretty permanent. Mm -hmm. How about special education? I mean, do, does, do we provide um, benefits to private students, too? Yes. By law, we would have to. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's another permanent... Service. So, yeah, so so an example of that could be a, a student with an IEP at a non-public who's, who, are they a resident of ours, if right? They're, if they're a resident of that, yeah. Like if they According, require. They have like to live a, within the residency and right. then the local L, uh, LEA, which is us, right. is required to do any kind of testing and any kind of services. Right, and if they require something like a one-to-one -one aid or something like that, if they're a Beacon City School District resident student, we would pay for that, correct? Right. And if they are not, then we then the, their uh, district of residence would pay us for right. it. Right. So if a Wappinger student was at one of our non-publics, they're paying for the special education part of it. Yes. Okay. How, how many? I'm sorry. I didn't. I, in my list, I didn't list that one. No, it's fine. It's fine. That's why well, it's Q and A. Um, Matt, I can speak to that if you want. Yeah. Fine. Okay. Go ahead, Julissa. <laughs> Just for a point of clarification, so every year, similar to the Title I, uh, the PPS department meets with our private schools that are located in Beacon to discuss the kinds of services the district can provide based on the brand. So if a student lives, has an IP that lives outside of Beacon City School District and attends a private school in the city of Beacon, um, similar to the Title I uh, grant, uh, Don Candelo meets with the representative from the private school they discuss the kind of services that the district can provide. Um, it's not a one-for-one. -one. So if a student receives a one-to-one -one aid in their, let's say, Newburgh School District or Peak Skill, wherever they're coming from, we offer um, whatever is agreed to by the uh, private school representative this year and last year. We offer related services um, in our building. So the students are transported from their private school to Beacon to receive related services as per their IEP. And it does not have to be a one-to-one. -one. So if they receive four sessions of speech therapy a week in, let's say, Newburgh, they would get the, not the equivalent, but something comparable here in Beacon. Um, and this year we provided also resource room support. Um, so we have a special ed teacher who goes to the private school and meets uh, with the students who have, um, who need special education support. Um, and again, that service is agreed to by the, the director of the private school with the director of PPS, and they discuss that based on the needs of the students with IEPs that are attending the private school in the city of Beacon. Um, so that can change depending on how they would like that service provided, and it, the consultation happens at the end of the school year in preparation for, um, I think it happens in April, um, in preparation for the following year. No, thank you. Uh, how how many private schools do we have in our district? In 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 the Beacon City School District, there are two. Two, okay. And how many private schools do we transport to? 
Uh, wow. I don't know wow. off the top of my head, <laughs> but I can find out, and we do talk about that during the budget process for transportation. I know okay. that's always a data point that we always share, so I'll have to get back to you on that. Okay. Does the number 16 sound right? I don't know. I think it's like more. It's more than it's that. More than I, that. I, for some reason, I thought that the um, mileage was 15 miles. I didn't remember that it was 35. Has that changed in the? Um, I know it's 50 for special ed. Yeah. So I, I could be wrong about the 35. I can oh. double check. Are there other questions? Do, do we know of any other private schools that are opening in the area? or it, it, it too vegan? seems to be small. I thought there were more than that. Well, that are just in the district. I the, mean, right. there are private schools all around us in this area that are not part of the, you know, Beacon City School District geography. Like Randolph, I guess, is Randolph? They're in Wappingers. Wappingers. Right? Wappingers. But there's, there are students, there are children that live in Beacon that attend Randolph School right. and that we transport to Randolph School. Oh. So there's the school on Walcott, on, the, on that church... Uh, mm -hmm. St. Luke's Church property, it's Covenant. So there was f Rose it's, Rose Hills, not a school or it's Rose Hills is a daycare. Is a daycare. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. All right. So I mean, this is you know, if you have more questions, please feel free to to bring them up. We can do it by email, or we can have a a further further questions about it. But I feel like that's everybody feel okay for tonight. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Can I have a motion to adjourn to executive session to review the employment history of a particular individual to discuss matters made exempt by federal or state law uh, with regard uh, regarding um, collective bar wait sorry I lost myself EG family there. educational rights and privacy act with regard to student matters and to seek legal advice from the school attorney um, state law attorney client privilege regarding collective bargaining with the CSEA and the BEAA, and the board will return in about 45 minutes. So moved. Second. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Passes 8 to 0. Um, I'm just going to go over the agenda changes. Uh, we have a few changes. Changes to the instructional personnel list 12.04, additions D13F. 3 through 12, J4, and H and N, H has been removed and has been re revised. Uh, are there any parent groups or student and school presentations? There are none in this room. Are there any on Zoom? It doesn't look like it. I'm going to talk really slowly. Yeah, the, the Michael Adam check guy is pretty quiet. <laughs> Matt, do you want to um, give your superintendent's report? Sure. It will be very brief tonight. Um, <clears throat> I just wanted to uh, provide a huge thank you. We, over the last few weeks, we've had a huge number of community volunteers uh, step up and help us with uh, both doing vaccine clinics and also the rapid test uh, distribution. And tonight we had the, uh, another clinic um, for any shot that's uh, approved and available. So uh, we had about 12 volunteers tonight uh, who processed paperwork and helped get that line moving the whole time, and, uh, and it went really well. And so I just you know, wanted to take a moment. It's impressive that these folks keep coming back and helping. Meredith, want to give you a shout out. You're one of our <laughs> trusty volunteers, and, and, uh, but it's really made these go well. Uh, it looks like the state's doing another uh, home rapid test distribution, so I'll be letting the community know more details about that hopefully in the next few days. And that's it. That's all I got. Thank you. I have a question. So I, I don't get the power school emails. I just happened to go to that one because a parent told me about it, and I was like, oh, all right, let me see I got it. But, I mean, I, I'd be more than happy to help. If I knew uh, more, more opportunities okay. are available. I, I will do a better job of forwarding them all to the board. Okay. All right. Thanks. Okay. Um, thank you, Matt. So committee reports and board comments. Um, Anthony? Sure. Um, the diversity committee did, 
Did we do that? Did we do that? Uh, we did it before or after the December meeting, board meeting. The yeah, the equity after. The, no, yeah, the, the two the two work groups. Huh? Ah, uh, okay. I'm sorry. Okay, so yeah, nothing, not nothing new in diversity. Sorry about that. I I lose track of time. I don't know. It's, um, yeah, I don't know what's. But uh, I did actually. So time. I did want to ask if um, now that uh, you know the COVID um stuff's changing and return to the office and all that stuff from people's uh, um occupations um are not may not be the same as they were before um. Do we still want to have board meetings on Monday? Uh, not a discussion that I, I feel like we need to have tonight at 9.30 at night, but it's something that I am um, was curious about. Um, you know, I'm, I'm still committed to coming on Mondays, um, you know, when there are, um, um, but I, I'm, I'm no longer like in the same situation where I, I can't commit to other nights. So before I was. Um. I can do a quick poll on another night if you want, and and um, and we can see if it's worth discussion. Sure. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, and that's it. Happy New Year. Thank you, John. Um, I've got nothing to say. Jasmine, I don't have anything to say. Thank you. Um, Anthony. Uh, the curriculum committee has not met since our last board meeting. Our next curriculum committee meeting is January 26th at 3.30 here in the LGI room. No other comments. Thank you, Anthony. Craig? Oh, I have several. Um, so since Kristen's not here, I'll just briefly mention that facilities and operations did meet last Thursday. We had uh, a good discussion with our various consultants uh, from uh, architects and uh, also, our uh, district financial consultants sat in on that meeting so that we could be sure we're all checking in on the right pages. We mostly talked about the, uh, the scheduling and the phasing of how this uh, capital program will go over uh, a couple of years. Um, nothing too exciting, basically just checking to make sure that we know what we're doing and everybody's on the same page. Um, we uh, had a meeting of the Audit and Finance Committee, same night. Uh, also with uh, our consultants, uh, th we have gentlemen from the firm of Bernard Donegan, which is a financial consultant that helps school districts like ours know where opportunities may exist, and they discovered one, which uh, is on our agenda tonight. Uh, we said, please go ahead with it and pull it together because uh, Times are wasting. We, we have an opportunity to save money. Uh, this is the refunding or refinancing, if you want to use that term, of some bonds that actually were already refinanced. So this is our second time at making some savings on this. It was a capital program from many years ago. And I think these bonds were 2012. And we have about uh, seven years or so left on them. We have the opportunity to save about $80,000 in interest expense. That is the more conservative estimate. It could be better. Depends upon exactly what happens when we get there to the trigger point. Um, so you'll see that on the agenda, and we can discuss it further later if need be. Uh, we also um, had a report on how we're doing with the RFP request for proposals for a new internal auditor. Um, you basically have three auditors. We have a claims auditor who works for us and audits all the bills as they come through. We have our CPA firm that does the annual audit uh, from the outside. That's uh, uh, once a year situation. And then we had uh, added an internal auditor who works on opportunities that we should probably look at that we, where we could make things a little better. Um, and that firm was reporting difficulties with enough personnel to be able to really meet our schedule and do anything much for us. So we decided to go out and look for who else might be out there. And uh, we would probably hear back. This, this has been published. So in a few weeks or so, we may see some, some results. We'll review them and probably come back to you, hopefully, with 
a recommendation for a replacement firm. Um, and the other thing is that uh, I would mention that our, our two community volunteers have really kicked in. They're participating and they're making observations and asking questions. So I'm very pleased to see that. And the other, other thing to mention is something completely unrelated to that is that um, I serve as an advisor to the Foundation for Beacon Schools as part of a board liaison connection. And one of the issues that they are looking at uh, investing in is actually a way to improve or enhance the teaching of local history. This is very new. Uh, and I was asked to chair that uh, project or committee or whatever it turns out to be for the foundation. And I accepted. And one of the first things to do is sit down with our assistant superintendent for uh, curriculum and student support, Sagrario Rudicindo O'Neill. Did I do all that right? Okay, good. I get an A. Good. So we had a great meeting and identified a lot of opportunities for where we could go to start on this. And uh, including what exactly where does local history get taught in our curriculum through 12 years or more. And uh, the other issue is how do we uh, pull together some kind of uh, team uh, to start working on this and find some actual uh, useful items that could be inserted uh, to improve the, uh, the teaching of local history. We have a lot of opportunities here. It's a matter of figuring out just, okay, nice idea, now how do you do that? So that's, uh, we've started anyway. Thank you. Yep. Alyssa? Um, good evening. The uh, next meeting of the Policy Committee is January 31st, currently on the calendar, and we are um, reviewing and improving three policies this evening. Um, I don't really have any other comments except to thank um, Ms. DeFonce and Mr. Glenn, Mr. Glenn, right, mm -hmm. um, for their presentations tonight. Really exciting, and uh, thank you. Thank you. Laura? Yeah, so since I wasn't at the last meeting, I wanted to give an update on the um, Lower Hudson Education Commission uh, legislative panel, which took place last month. Um, it was uh, really great to see that most of the advocacy priorities that we had listed were, were discussed in the meeting. And um, there were a lot of uh, legislators there, including um, Sue Serino uh, and um, a few, I just wanted to bring up a few highlights. Um, foundation aid was a really big discussion point, um, specifically that the formula doesn't reflect the true cost of the Lower Hudson Valley and current student needs. There's a lot of excitement about the fact that um, Governor Holchul seems um, committed to, to fully funding it um, over the coming uh, few years, but um, there was concern about uh, the issue of using um, property wealth as a significant factor in the formula. Um, the, the thought being that students, many students in the public schools don't represent the residents who have that high property wealth um, and that it can lead to, um, to funding inequities in communities that have more need um, but higher land value, which I thought was an interesting point and, and something that, um, that I think could, could apply to Beacon in some, some sense. Um, they also talked about making the tax cap formula more efficient. Um, there was discussion about adding to the LHEC um, advocacy agenda, um, decoupling APPR from state tests. Uh, so, you know, um, teacher performance being, being judged partly based on student test performance. Um, there was also some discussion about um, you know, open meetings law um, to allow for more virtual meetings and no excuse absentee ballots. Um, but I think that one of the biggest discussions was around mental health support. Um, there was a lot of talk about including more in-house care, more embedded support and professional development, um, more uh, investment in community mental health services, which is something that we've spoken about as a board, um, and the idea that we need more brick and mortar crisis locations. Apparently, this is something that Westchester has been talking about creating, um, and there was urging from legislators that everybody at the state level needs to really start pushing for this. Um, so it was an interesting and, and informative meeting, and I think uh, can sort of inform 
us as we go into um, the New York State School Board Association's Legislative Lobby Day, uh, which has now been switched from in-person to virtual. Uh, they just made that announcement today. So it's taking place virtually on the 9th, um, and we can, you can register for it now. I will forward the link to everyone just in case you didn't get it. And in terms of the um, public relations advocacy and legislative committee meeting, uh, it's take, the next one is taking place at 6 p.m. before the school board meeting on January 24th, and I hope that we will take some time to talk more about these issues and prepare for the lobby day. And that's it. Thank you. And I have no comments. Uh, we don't have any new business tonight. So moving on to item 11, resolution for appeal of superintendent's hearing. Uh, the language for the resolution is not attached to board doc, so I'm going to read it here. Be it resolved that the Board of Education of the Beacon City School District hereby affirms the superintendent's decision and suspension of student number 011022 issued pursuant to an education law 3214 superintendent's hearing and further authorizes the board president to inform the parents of student number 011022 of its decision dated January 10th, 2022. Can I have a motion to approve resolution 011022? 22A. So moved. Second. Anthony, or Anthony and Flora, are there any comments or questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> I am in favor, so it passes 8 to 0. Item 12 is um, the refunding bond resolution that Craig talked about from uh, that we discussed at our audit meeting. Um, can I have a motion to approve resolution 011022B? So he? He is in boy. This one, the, the, this says A again, I think. Uh, I got B. Und oh. Under 12, I think you're still looking at. Um, oh, well, the, you know the motion. Yeah. On the second say, page, it says. Yeah, the motion actually says um, A, but it should be B. Yeah, on the second page, if you're looking at that. Okay. Kelly, do you, you got that? Yeah. I got B. I don't know. And at where the language for the motion is, it says A. So, um, Anthony, did you move for that? Oh, second. Anthony, and second from Craig. Are there any comments or questions about this? Yeah, so, um, actually, I was, my question was going to be, what's a refunding bond? But I think you had, so it's a refinancing. Yeah, basically, a refi. So it's called refunding, but it's refinancing. Yeah. Okay. They use the term refunding, uh, but, you know, and if it was your mortgage, it would be a refi. Okay. <laughs> or if you... Got rid of an old car loan for one at a lower rate, yeah, same deal. And it'll save us money. Yeah, about, yeah, it looks like at about 80000 over seven years, okay. so maybe t 10 or so a year. It's not a huge amount, but, you know, everything counts, so. Uh, and, and it might be even better if the interest rates come in more favorably. There was an alternate scenario that looked like we might save 100000 but this is the kind of the conservative pr presentation, if you will. And this is net of all fees, by the way, so it's has to be some, something that has to show a, a net savings. No, the savings could help us get Ruby Bridges. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> we will put it to use, I'm sure. Uh, any other comments or questions? Roll, uh, Kelly, can you do a roll call vote? Ms. Betterhead? Aye. Flynn is excused. Mr. Galloway? Aye. Ms. Johnson? Aye. Mr. Singh? Aye. Mr. White? Yes. Mr. Wolf? Yes. Ms. Stadler? Aye. Ms. Pewer? Yes. So eight to zero in favor. Thank you. Okay, the consent agenda. Where did my... Uh, The use of the consent agenda permits the Board of Education to make more effective use of its time by adopting a single motion to cover those relatively routine matters which are included. Any member of the Board who wishes to discuss individually a particular piece of business on the consent agenda may so indicate and that item will be considered and voted on separately, thus preserving the right of all Board members to be heard on any issue. Are there any items that any Board member would like to have removed from the consent agenda? Uh, 
I'm trying to find the item number my computer's acting up, but there was a, a series of contracts. Uh, 1310? 1310. Yeah. Any others? Can I have a motion to approve 13.01 through 1313, last 1310? So moved. Second. Anthony, Flora, second. Um, all in favor? Aye. Oh, sorry, Com comments or questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? I'm in favor. Passes 8 to 0. Can I have a motion to approve 13.10? So moved. Anthony, is there a second? Second. Flora? Comments or questions? That's a lot of contracts. What changed? I see. contracts are, they're called SED cards. They're basically a pass-through. So some of the um, Section 611, 619 grant that we receive goes to the schools where our children are actually attending school. Okay. And they get a portion of the federal grant under 611, 619. Okay. So that's why they sum up t together like that. You and not, and not, and see them all at, at one time, so this time you got them all. Yeah, and normally we see contracts usually around the summertime, too. Um, these were a little bit delayed. They usually come in around now. Okay. Um, it also depends on the timing of the grant. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Passes 8 to 0. Can I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? Anthony, so moved. Anthony, second? Second. Laura, uh, all in favor? Uh, aye. aye. Opposed? Passes 8 to 0. Have a great night, everyone. Thank you.